first, Professor Madsen, uh, we are just so grateful that you've agreed to be interviewed in the series. And uh, uh, as you know, the series is, is, a, is a focused on those who have studied, researched, published on the, the history of Christianity in China. But one of the things by way of introduction that I think I should point out, and that is that, that you have published widely beyond the scope of that particular topic. And I'm thinking of a book uh, that you published on the religious practice and political landscape in Taiwan, a book entitled China and the American Dream, uh, certainly uh, one of your very well-received monographs that I just read a, 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 a review of is Morality and Power in a Chinese Village. But in this field, the field of Christianity in China, I think you're best known for your work, China's Catholics Tragedy and Hope in an Emerging Civil Society. Certainly that work is cited quite a lot, but you've also given a number of talks, published other things. Um, and, and one of the things that when I talk to other scholars about your particular legacy in this field, that is that you are among the most consulted scholars on the current situation of Christianity in China as it is at this moment. But with all that said, the purpose is to interview you. So as you know, we have the same fundamental five questions. We may have a tangent. <laughs> but, but let me begin with the first question, and that is, uh, Professor Madsen, what brought you to the field of Christianity in China the study of Christianity in China, and perhaps what maybe attracted you to the particular areas about which you've researched? Well, you know, a lot of my career has been uh, a lot of arbitrary chance, I suppose, maybe providence, whatever. In any case, uh, unplanned uh, kind of, you know, detours. So, uh, you know, I started out uh, at a young age uh, studying in the, in the seminary to be a, a marinal missionary priest. And uh, I went through uh, the seminary and actually was ordained in 1968. And at that point, our superior general, uh, maybe even because of a punishment, because I had written something in any way that, that he didn't like at, the, at that point, uh, sent me to Taiwan. And so uh, and that was actually probably the last place I would have wanted to go. I was interested in going off to Latin America, et cetera. And in uh, any case, uh, I got sent to Taiwan. I didn't know anything about China, about Taiwan, about anything. So I got sent there in 68 and uh, got sent to a language school. Uh, and actually most of the Marinoers who were very oriented toward working at grassroots, you know, uh, farming villages and so forth, uh, studied the, the native uh, local dialect, Taiwanese, Haklo. Uh, they had a school in, in, in Taichung. Uh, but then also because of some internal political things that were going on in Marino, they sent me and my uh, confer at the time to uh, the language school in Shinju, which is run by the Jesuits, and where we learn, uh, you know, Mandarin Chinese. So uh, I studied Chinese there for two years. And while there, uh, I got to know uh, a lot of Jesuits from uh, different countries, actually, including a bunch from California, uh, which was a kind of relief to me because most of the Marinoans were from the East Coast, you know, York area, Boston, and so forth. So uh, these, there were these California Jesuits, as well as some from Germany and France and Belgium and so forth and so on. So um, I got to know them, and uh, a few of them were interested in kind of not just working in Taiwan, but in the so-called China question, because this was a time of the Cold War, you know, very bad relationship, U.S.-China, Vietnam War, the whole thing. And uh, they thought we needed a kind of a reconciliation with China. And uh, basically reconciliation in terms of not just political things, but in terms of values and culture, et cetera. So uh, I got <clears throat> interested in that. And um, there were a few Jesuits and myself who were interested in forming a group eventually called China Concern, is what we're gonna call it, that would, um, you know, deal with that. But first we would have to get uh, PhDs, you know, in different fields. And um, 
there were several. One was already interested in doing political science. He went to Stanford. Another one, uh, Eric Hansen. Uh, another one, uh, Paul Stadelmeyer was into economics. He also went to Stanford. Uh, and uh, and but so what was left was sociology. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, okay, uh, so I said, and I'd like to deal with the grassroots. And uh, one thing I got from, you know, being with Mary Noel was going to these villages and, and also Aborigine communities and, you know, for festivals and so forth and so on, and kind of a feel for people at the grassroots. So anyway, so I, um, I said I would try to do sociology. And as part of that went to... Um, Taiwan University, National Taiwan University in 1971. No, actually 1970, I guess, 1971. And I spent a year there living in a dorm as my Jesuit friend had done the year before and studying in sociology. And uh, that was very good. I kind of had a full immersive experience and I, I could, uh, it was good for my Chinese too, uh, because I, I learned, uh, you know, communicate with people who had different accents than the formal accents of the language teachers. Also, reading was very good. I, I learned how to read. Uh, Professor Manson, well, we lost connection there briefly. Uh, we're recording again. You ended talking about your move from, I guess you were in, in uh, where were you? Xinju studying, Xinju. and then, then you moved in, you were studying at Taiwan Dashia there in Taipei. So, um, <clears throat> And then I, I applied to uh, different universities, and got into Harvard uh, in, uh, for a master's in uh, East Asian studies. Uh, and so I went to Harvard, uh, but it was complicated reasons. Uh, I ended up you know, leaving Marino, uh, but I felt interested and, and committed to maintaining what I saw as my vocation to be a kind of a bridge builder between uh, East and West. And, and, and to carry out this work with, we started with the Jesuits, we, and, and all of me left the Jesuits, by the way, but we continued to work together in various ways, friendship ways and so forth, okay? So I was interested in kind of studying the East and West and uh, being a bridge builder especially in this realm of, of values and you know, meanings and so forth, and moral values. <clears throat> so I did that. And then <clears throat> when I was at Harvard, um, you know, uh, I didn't have an education like, uh, you know, classmates at Harvard had in Ivy League, you know, schools. And so uh, I always kind of work with what I knew. So <clears throat> I took a, a, we had a seminar with, uh, John Fairbank on, uh, on, you know, Chinese history, modern Chinese history. And uh, <clears throat> I, I took one subject I thought I knew something about, I could know something about, uh, which was uh, history of, of YMCA in, in China. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I wrote a seminar paper on that, uh, on the YMCA and its you know, contributions or engagement with Chinese Revolution. Because you know, for instance, the secretary of the YMCA in, in, the 30, in the 30s and 40s was, you know, um, uh, you know, Y.T. Yao, you know, and uh, uh, became a real argument, the head of this free self movement later on and so forth. So I, um, uh, I, I did that. At that time, the archives of the why actually we're in New York. They've moved now, I believe, in Minnesota. So it's pretty easy to go down to New York, stay actually with Marinos, and uh, go through their archives. And I wrote this paper uh, about, uh, about the why and about general issues, part of Christianity in China. So that paper, uh, it, it, we never published it. We didn't, we weren't into publishing at the time, but that paper is still being used. I, I was at Chinese U a few, um, a year ago or two years ago, and some student there was writing a, a PhD and using that paper as the foundation because it was in the library of a Chinese U. It had a, a even a library number on it. <laughs> and I had shared a few copies of it. This was before digital stuff with a few friends. And somehow I had no idea how, you know, a copy ended up in the CUHK library. But in any case, people are still using it, the paper, which is good. So then 
And then um, through those kind of connections, uh, <clears throat> I had a connection with my friend Donald McGinnis, uh, who was the head of the National Council of Churches uh, program on China at the time. And uh, he was, had been a, a Methodist, Methodist missionary in China at the end of the 40s. And uh, an old, you know, China hand. And, uh, and so he asked me to come to uh, the, the headquarters of the, of the uh, National Council of Churches at the um, Riverside Drive in New York, spend summers there, to help them develop their outreach towards China. So at that point, I went over all sorts of materials I had, <clears throat> especially about the three self movement and so forth, not, not about the Catholics very much. Uh, and that was, you know, uh, it helped me in my studies at Harvard, but also uh, it got me engaged with uh, the whole effort of, of, you know, Protestant churches to, to reach out to China. And so then in 1974, or 73, but then beginning of 74, he invited me to attend this uh, meeting <clears throat> in, um, organized by the World Council of Churches, by the World Lutheran Federation, actually, and the Catholic group called Lumen Vitae, uh, that had a preliminary meeting in, uh, in Sweden, uh, but then a more plenary meeting in the end of, of in the summer of 74 in uh, Belgium at Lugan, the Catholic University in, in, in Belgium. So uh, I did that. And I wrote some papers, took part in that. And the whole issue was to try to kind of, for Christians to grapple with the issues of China. At this point, Marino wasn't in the picture uh, anymore, although I, I remained you know, friends with them. Uh, and then I went off and did my uh, <clears throat> field work, my dissertation in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, because we couldn't go to China at that point. And I ended up, uh, working with some other graduate students and then on my own writing about Chen Village and so forth. So, uh, and especially morality and power, I was interested in kind of value systems in China, morality, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, so that was my take on, on, on sociology, kind of grassroots sociology. So I asked people about the the sort of the moral dilemmas and so forth in this revolutionary situation. So anyway, so <clears throat> then uh, I, I came back uh, and finished my PhD at Harvard. And then I ended up um, <clears throat> uh, coming here to UC San Diego, got a job here. And so I've been here ever since. So, um, and also at that point, just as I got back to San Diego, the uh, Marinoers, they, they asked me to come back to, to Marino to, um, to help them set up their, their, their China program. Uh, they wanted to set up a, Ch a China program. And so, you know, I'm, I was happy to do that. So I, I, I worked for a summer there. I helped draw up a kind of a strategic plan for, for the work in China and so forth and so on. And, uh, and then they wanted me at the end of that to first of all go to a meeting in Belgium uh, with some of the same people that I had been with at that earlier meeting in, in 74, you know, in, in, in Leuven and in, in Sweden, uh, because they knew I had the contacts with the people and so forth. And so the, the, the deputy superior general wanted to go also so I could introduce them, you know, and, and all that. So I did that group, basically kind of ecumenical group to, to uh, study various, what was going on with the churches in China. So that was my first trip in 19, um, I guess 1979, just after US-China relations were normalized, we could go. We went up to Hunan and then round through Guilin and then uh, Guangzhou. And uh, especially in Guangzhou met uh, the, the kind of Catholics there the Catholic Church itself was pretty much practically deserted. A few old women there kind of going to, you know, pray. Uh, but um, 
uh, we met the bishop, Bishop uh, Dungy Min, who later on uh, got denounced by China and so forth. Uh, and he was just coming out of confinement and so forth. And then went back to Hong Kong, in which we had some meetings to set up this kind of uh, program of reaching out to China, which ended up helping, I think, create this beginning was at the Holy Spirit Study Seminary uh, Center, uh, based in the, in the Catholic Seminary there, to reach out to the Catholic Church in China. And a key person there was Ed Malatesta, who was a Jesuit, uh, who was very keen on developing a new relationship with China. Uh, Ed later on died tragically, you know, untimely way through some you know, sickness he had. But, uh, so he was a big help. And, and then uh, one thing that was founded at the same, around the same time was a magazine called Tripod, which was based in the Holy Spirit Studies Center uh, with articles and so forth about, you know, church in China, etc. cetera. So, um, <clears throat> so I was engaged with this kind of thing, you know, as a kind of a helper. Uh, from that point. And then uh, <clears throat> in the mid 80s, I was teaching here in, you know, in San Diego and continuing different kinds of research on China, also in America, American culture and society with Robert Bella and other colleagues. Uh, all on the issue of this issue, which we call values and morality and moral order and so forth. So <clears throat> uh, then then I was asked by Dan Bays, a uh, historian of China, pioneering, pioneer historian of Christianity in China, to help out to, um, uh, he got a grant from the Luce Foundation to, uh, uh, you know, write about the history of Christianity in China. And we had gave out uh, grants uh, to different people who applied to study various aspects of this. And so I was on the committee that helped to uh, evaluate these applications and so forth and so on. And so uh, I was involved with a number of meetings in New York uh, with um, Dan and then, and then a, a committee of others um, vetting these applications and you know, trying to move forward the study of history of Christianity in China, which had long been a kind of a, a field of study in Chinese history, but kind of a marginal one. Uh, and I'm just grateful to the Luce Foundation for helping to kind of move this forward, and for Dan for his very, very important pioneering work. So then it, <clears throat> around 1988, <clears throat> I also, in connection with a few of my colleagues from San Diego here, uh, Paul Pickowitz and then Perry Link, who at that time was at UCLA, we put together a series of a, a book on called Unofficial China, on kind of grassroots, uh, you, know, you know, understand people in China, how they understood things. And so when it came time for me to think of something to do, uh, I, I, I basically went to my um, friends at the Tripod magazine, I had all their back issues, and combed through those to put together kind of a picture of what was known at the point of. Catholicism in China. So I wrote an essay. That was my contribution to the unofficial China book, uh, which I don't know very well. Around 1992, I think, or so, uh, UC San Diego, where it was, <clears throat> uh, some of the leaders, they wanted us to be, uh, build up our programs about, about Asia. And so they wanted to get this grant from the uh, Luce Foundation to um, study civil society in China. That was the time. So I, I could get their grant, but I wouldn't have to look at this part. I actually wouldn't have to do the work on my project. But anyway, so I thought I would do that. And uh, so then we actually got the grant. <clears throat> so then when I went off, it, our, our um, collaborator on this grant was Tianjin um, Academy of Social Sciences. So uh, I went to, uh, off to Tianjin to uh, say, okay, I'm going to do like a preliminary, you know, two-week 
pilot kind of study of this. And so um, I got there and um, they kind of gave me the runaround when I was there. And they first welcomed me and all that, you know, and, and the you know, banquets, the whole thing. And then, uh, and then I, uh, this, this man in Lincher, Yu, who was a uh, leisure, who was a very famous scholar of Chinese popular religion, who was elderly at the time, uh, who was a Catholic. He, he came by, he was going to help. He said, great, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll go tomorrow and we will interview the uh, priest at the uh, you know, cathedral here and get you started. And so then the next day, <clears throat> the uh, kind of head of the, the se segment of the uh, Academy of Social Sciences came to me and said, no, actually just check with the uh, public security and others. And he said, you can't do this. So, okay, so I said, this was kind of frustrating. And so then uh, I, um, I get ready to go back home. But at that point, it was the 15th of, of, uh, of August. And it was, you know, um, 15 August, the Feast of the Assumption of Mary, right? And in China, that's what I, I knew at least that uh, enough to know that was one of the major festival feast days in China. Uh, Feast of the Assumption, Pentecost, uh, Easter, and Christmas. So the four big, big kind of festivals, Catholic festivals in, in China. So I, um, um, I said, I asked them, well, can, can I just go to, to, to mass and just to see it? And they said, okay, you can go, but you, uh, you can't talk to anybody. You can't talk to any priest. Uh, you go sit in the back uh, just, and take some pictures if you want. So um, I went and I was kind of you know, blown away. The 7 a.m. mass and the church was totally packed, you know, standing room only. And uh, a beautiful choir and the people were really deeply devout into it. And uh, it was really very impressive. And uh, and then it was also a day when uh, about 50 young children um, received the first Holy Communion, uh, half of them girls, half of them boys. And even though you weren't supposed to teach religion to people, you know, um, under the age of 18. Uh, so they were all receiving the first, very beautiful. And then afterwards they, they came out and they, uh, People there, oh, say, you take some pictures, take some more pictures, they help me, and so forth. So I, I did that. And then uh, <clears throat> I took a picture of the bishop. And then they said, oh, come, come back tomorrow. Uh, the 15th was a Saturday. And so they come back tomorrow. So, um, so the next day uh, was, was Sunday. And all my, uh, you know, handlers at the uh, Tenji Academy were at a day off. They wanted, so they just told me to just to rest in the hotel. So I said, okay, it's Sunday, we'll go to mass. And uh, at that point, I knew where the, where the cathedral was and got a ta taxi. And so I went there. And uh, again, it was just about as crowded as it was on the Feast of the Assumption. And, and the music was beautiful, the whole thing. So I was there, and then afterwards they said, "Oh, come, come back to the uh, rectory here, and uh, uh, you can, we show you some pictures of the ceremony yesterday. Uh, we have some videos and of the, uh, of the first communion and all that. You can see them. So great. So I went to the, you know, into the um, a rectory, and I, uh, you know." Uh, uh, and they, they, they showed me the videos, but also they had a big photo album. They said, look at our photo albums. They had, they had photos of all the different things they've been doing the last couple of years. You know, they could tell me about it and so forth. So that was very, it was very good. So I took notes. And then, uh, you know, I spent the whole morning there, and that, maybe afternoon. And then I went, you know, took a cab back to my hotel. And I never mentioned to the people in Tianjin Academy, you know, what I had done. I figured they must have probably learned about it, but uh, uh, no one, you know, no mentioned it to me either. So it was all good. And so, 
And so then uh, I, I talked to the director of the uh, Tianjin Academy. At that point, by the way, I was quite fascinated. At first I thought, well, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna have to do this. Then I thought, wow, this is illicit and it's great and all the, it's very important. And so now we're gonna, we're gonna find a way to do it. And so uh, <clears throat> the uh, director of the uh, academy was, was very good to me. And he said, okay, we'll, we'll manage to make this happen next year. So I was only there for two weeks to get preliminary things started. And then I had a, um, the issue was, there, there's supposed to be someone working with me. This is part of the Lose Foundation thing. And the um, person that was assigned to me was obviously not at all interested in this subject. So then the director said, there's another person, this young woman, you know, finally Drew, she's interested in these kinds of things. You can work, maybe you can work with her. So I, you know, met her, you know, had a, had a good talk and said, we could do this. And so it turned out later on, she had been an invaluable, important helper. So, so then the, the next year I came back and uh, uh, ended up, you know, doing this work with uh, Fonley Jew for about three months or so. It was all part of our grant. And uh, uh, then at one point, <clears throat> Uh, this person I knew at the cathedral, I used to go there every Sunday, go to mass there and, you know, meet them and continue the dialogue with them and learn about what was going on there. And what was going on there uh, was, you know, the, the time when I had first come uh, the year before, there had been signs on the, on the door of the cathedral, kind of mimeograph signs saying, uh, had, had to do with, you had to be careful about doing this and that. Then I figured what happened was at that time, there was Bishop, Bishop Fun, who, an underground bishop, and he had gone around ordaining many other priests and bishops in the whole Hubei region. And um, uh, he, he was a staunch person uh, at the underground church. And in 19... Uh, 89, he had helped organize um, this meeting of uh, underground bishops in, in, the, in the fall of 89, which was after the Tiananmen massacre, uh, with, with the hope of really organizing underground church. Anyway, the meeting got raided by the police. They were thrown in prison. He was in prison. He'd been in and out of prison for many, many years. Okay. Uh, and he was somehow let out in maybe 79, and then he became a bishop underground, and then uh, and so forth. So he was in prison, and then in 92, just before I had, uh, you know, come to Tianjin that first time, uh, I found out, you know, through sources at Holy Spirit Study Center and so forth, that what happened was he was let out of prison. He had served, they just given his sentence and his time was up. The day before he was supposed to be released, uh, he died in the prison. Okay? And uh, the authorities said he had a heart attack or something. Anyway, uh, the Catholics, you know, so his body looked like he'd been beaten to death. Okay? And so uh, the Catholics in the area were totally up in arms. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> They brought his body, body back to his home uh, village. It was in Hubei province. And um, the, uh, the, the whole huge contingent of PLA soldiers had, had tried to block anything happening. People came anyway, and uh, they had this big funeral with 10,000 people showing up. So as this was going on, and that's why at two years previously, things were so, had been so tense. And then um, in 1993, when I was there, the, the person I knew at the cathedral said, oh, you know why uh, we were so good to you that in that previous year, we helped you meet the bishop and all that and had you take these pictures. That was because the day that first communion happened, piece of the assumption, uh, 
the underground church was all around there. And they were going to make a big, like a big uh, demonstration, riot. They were going to disrupt the whole thing, disrupt his first communion and everything. That was the underground. And so when we, you came out, we, we told him, look, here's this foreigner taking pictures and you can't, you can't, uh, you know, cause any trouble today. <laughs> and so, and so that's why they were so good to me. Okay. And so that's, you know, anyway, so I was, you know, wandering in where, you know, fools with angels fear to tread. So that was there. So <clears throat> all that was still going on. And uh, so we got to know a variety of people. And then we did these interviews in, in these villages. And so what we did was, I and Farmley Jew, we would go to these villages and we told the authorities that we were interested in just studying, you know, village life, you know. And but the village we went to were all villages that were all Catholic villages, all Catholics. So, so we did it, did it that way. And then we, we had a great time, uh, got some good interviews and really quite fascinating. And then, but then um, later on, uh, we ran in one village and then people uh, suggested we go to the adjacent village to see this other man, Wang Mingdao, or Wang, anyway, he was, uh, he was a kind of a lay leader of the, of the underground church there. And so uh, we went over, it was a 10 minute walk. You couldn't even see where the boundaries of the villages were, but went over there and uh, went to his house. And inside his house, he had a whole room set up as a little chapel. And that's where the underground priests would come and say mass and so forth. It was kind of a roving underground priest in the area. So I had a great time interviewing him and, uh, and talking about his history. He'd suffered terribly in the Cultural Revolution because of his faith. And then uh, we went back. <clears throat> the next day, we went to um, do some more interviews. OK. So anyway, these police came, and, th and they told us that we shouldn't be there. And we, um, you know, um, uh, 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 had to get out. And uh, so it was kind of frightening. Okay. So. Um, and I told them, by the way, we had, we had met with the party secretary in the village, and he'd said it was okay to work there. It was at a banquet with him, actually, and he had said it was fine. The thing was, I think we, he was drunk when he said it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they said, well, you didn't ask us, the public security. I said, I didn't know we had to ask the public security. They said, you did. <laughs> and so, so out. And so we had to go back to Tianjin interviewed some people who had come from the village working as you know, migrant workers in, Tian, in Tianjin, which was good. Then later on, uh, finally, Ju, she went back. And then later on, as part of the Loose Foundation grant, she had to come to San Diego to kind of get, you know, get trained. So she brought her, her interview you know, uh, recordings and so forth and went over them and gathered more material that way. So, so anyway, so that was it. Then out of that, and then supplementing that with stuff from the Holy Spirit Study Center and so forth, uh, I wrote this book, you know, uh, Chinese Catholics. Chinese Catholics. So, and at the time, you know, it was, I didn't think that the subject was, was very marginal to kind of like, you know, academic China scholars, China studies. But uh, then it turned, but I did it because, you know, of these accidents, but also because of my connection, you know, from Mary Noel and everything else. And so I, um, uh, the, the, partly by surprise, you know, there was kind of a vacuum in the literature and, and the treatment of Catholics and other Christians raised human rights issues and so forth regarding China. So everyone wanted to know about this. And so then giving, you know, a lot of talk about the papers and stuff about the And then I, I also, through my various contacts and everything else, became interested and more engaged at that time in general study of Christianity in general in China, not just Catholicism. And so I 
written a number of different papers about that, and, you know, uh, continue to uh, to write about that and to be engaged in this ongoing field. So that's that's my basic story about how I got into into doing all this. Right. This, the richness of this story, Professor Madsen, is that you began really in 1968. This is the beginning of the, the sort of more or less the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Correct. Through through this era, you're 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 within missiles distance of the of the, the of mainland China during the Cultural Revolution there in correct. Taiwan. Correct. correct, correct. And then and then the sort of going through into the 1980s, the church in China, as you know, has changed tremendously since then. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, you've answered so many of the questions already in that rich uh, description of your history. I wonder, and we're asking everyone to do one thing, and that is if you could recoll recollect a, a, a memory that you have about another scholar that you think should be remembered to our field. Well, I would say Dan Bays. And uh, as I said, we had this program with the Luce Foundation, and then I was a friend of Dan's you know, ever since. And uh, he, um, you know, was a wonderful person. And we would have these meetings and dinners after it in New York. And then later on in Kansas, he was professor at the University of Kansas at Lawrence. And, um, and he was a kind of an inspiration in both his, his, his commitments and his just, just generosity of spirit. And, you know, he passed away about two years ago or so. And uh, you know, also untimely, you know, he had a a brain tumor of sorts. And, uh, but he, he was really the kind of pioneer in the study of modern Chinese Christian history. And he was a very careful scholar and, uh, but also generous in all sorts of ways, intellectually generous, you know, spiritually generous. And so I, I, owe, I owe a lot to him and his inspiration. I sadly only met him once just toward the end, um, mm -hmm. and certainly is indeed one of the great pioneers. Because as you know, before people like yourself and Dan Bayes, people studied Matteo Ricci, and that almost seemed like Adam Schall von Bell and Ricci was all people would write about. And suddenly mm -hmm. your book came out and, and the floodgates opened for studying modern Christianity. Well, let me ask you a one last question, Professor Madsen, and that is, could you tell us a little bit about what your hopes are for the future of the field? Well, my hope is <clears throat> that it will continue to grow. I think we have uh, opened up the field to people and I'm seeing lots of, of younger you know, scholars, graduate students and others getting interested in this. Uh, also interested more generally in the study of religion in China, which was really marginalized because basically you know, secular scholars, even religious ones, uh, back in the 1950s or so, thought that religion, for better or for worse, was done in China. You know, communism and everything. It was unfortunate, maybe, but gone. But now there's been this big religious resurgence, and Christianity is one part of it. And of course, the situation of Christianity is very uh, fraught these days. And so, um, uh, and so I think it's attracting the attention of a number of people. Uh, there, there's some support through various kinds of foundations and so forth to study it. Uh, Young Fungan, you know, it, in Purdue has had money from Templeton Foundation and others to uh, develop this. There's some very interesting work done. People in Germany, the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. Anyway, uh, so it's it's become a lively field, and people are seeing it as worth studying and getting into it in ways that they weren't when uh, you know I started, right? And so um, I hope more people will will get into it, and I hope that they can have better access to China's you know studying it at the grassroots than we did in the past. Although now for foreign scholars, that's extremely become extremely difficult. Uh, but there are a number of people in in China who are are, are doing this. And you, you know uh, there's there's interesting studies happening. And I think um, one thing I hope comes out of it 
is just a better academic understanding of the complexity and richness and deep plurality of Chinese cultures. Uh, but then another thing I, I still hope to come out of it could be theological uh, 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 material for, for theologians of all kinds of, of Catholics, Protestants, or whatever, to think about you know, the diversities of ways in which Christianity has, has expressed itself and, and so forth, and to under, have a theology that can take better account of that, of that diversity. So I would hope that some of the material and ideas that we generate, you know, from social science and so forth, can can also help in that regard. So in that way, uh, you know, uh, my hope in the beginning was to be a kind of a bridge builder between, you know, China and the West, China and Christianity, and so forth. And so I kind of hope that, you know, that makes a small contribution to that. Professor Madsen, um, so first, again, thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. And let me personally thank you for your contribution to this field. I think everything that you just mentioned in terms of your hopes, uh, optimistically, I see the seeds of their realization already planted in the academic field. Mm -hmm. But again, thank you so much. What an honor it was for me to visit with you. and. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll interview you again sometime in the future and talk about new works because we're all saving space on our bookshelves for new works by, uh, by Richard Madsen. Good. Okay. I'll be, uh, it was wonderful to be in touch with you. So, okay. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. okay.